Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, so today we um, are hearing an amendment to 127 and then an amendment to 66. And then we are going to finish our work on 479 and 282. We're going to hear about 276 for the first time, which is the rental housing registry. And then if folks remember the conversation we had about school construction earlier in the session, we now have a bill on it, 486. And then we're going to the floor. Reminder that I stole your lunch period for the agenda. And we have a bajillion bills up for second reading. So support your people, make sure we're all on the floor, all those things. Um, and with that, Representative Harrison is here to tell us about an amendment on 127 that the Appropriations Committee made. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm Representative Jim Harrison, and I'm a member of House Committee on Appropriations. And I just wanted to share with you uh, the amendment that uh, we are proposing for H-127. Um, essentially, uh, what it does, uh, it, is it establishes a special fund called the sports wagering fund, which is um, very similar to what we do with lottery uh, and liquor, where the revenues and expenses come out of a special fund or in some cases an enterprise fund. And that's essentially what this did. So it's an amendment to the ways and means amendment. Um, it doesn't change uh, essentially anything other than uh, it sets up this special fund. It takes takes out your language on problem gambling program and then puts it back in as coming um, the money coming from the sports wagering fund and the revenues going in there. And then in the last case, the appropriations are exactly the same as you have it, but again, they're from the sports wagering fund, including the $550,000 uh, startup um, funds that were necessary to get the program going. So happy to answer any questions. Uh, it's I think it's pretty straightforward. We're just not doing general fund. We're doing sports wagering fund. Um, the money's the same. Thank you very much. I think we were trying to get ahead of you on the way we rearrange things and happier for you to rearrange it and appreciate setting it up the way you want it. Any other questions from anyone? Any, any questions? Yeah, Jim. Um, procedurally, mm -hmm. how do you want to do this on the floor? We're amending your amendment. So okay. I'm trying to think. Um, I assume GovOps will report their amendment because you're amending theirs. Well, they'll report the bill. Hmm? They'll, they'll report, report the bill. bill. Yeah. I don't know. We can check in with Betsy Ann about all of that. Okay. Later. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about who, what votes we do first. I think we vote on our amendment and then vote on your amendment. I, I don't know. We'll talk to that too. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that, about how the traffic works. Yeah. Appreciate your amendment to our amendment. Would anyone like to appreciate it by moving it? I move that we <laughs> consider this amendment from appropriations on H127 friendly. I will second that. Okay. Thank you. Representative Kenfield moved that we find <clears throat> friendly. Representative Sim seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, if the clerk could please call the roll. Andrews, yes. Anthony, yes. Beth, yes. Brannigan, yes. Demron, yes. Asland, yep. Matos, Odie, Sims, yes. Taylor, yes. Canfield, yes. Kornheiser, yes. Thank you. 10 0 2. Thank you very much, Representative. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, hopefully we'll see you on the floor later today, some point. Yeah, <laughs> on the floor. Just, just an approach on the floor. I'm sorry to hold you up. Well, I was betting that you would take <laughs> I, I did tell her you wouldn't. So we have a representative. <laughs> Shy, would you like to join us? <laughs> I feed him his lines. 
Mm -hmm. Hello, Representative. Good morning. Good to see you. Nice to be back in this committee that I've always loved. Special place in my heart for ways and means. We actually even saved a seat for you at the end of the table. <laughs> I did feel like I need a pillow, though, or something. It's very important. Okay. Anyway, so for the record, Robin Shai, uh, Representative Robin Shai from House Appropriations, here to tell you about the appropriations uh, amendment, which we uh, will have on the floor today. Um, first, just thank you all for the work that you have done and the fact that you and uh, Ledge Council and JFO put together such a great roadmap for this whole program really helped us figure out how to put our amendment together with a lot less um, angst. <laughs> so we actually have um, five instances of, of amendment, but two of them are yours. There are some technical amendments that you all were going to do, and we said we'll just put them in ours and not confuse the world by, by those. So, so frankly, if I get a question on the floor, I may yield. <laughs> but they're just technical. So, so um, what we did essentially was rather than appropriate the full $111.5 million, which was proposed out of this committee, we took about a third of it, $37 million, and we're proposing to fund $37 million to the program this year. So in our first instance of amendment is in section 13. Um, so in, there's currently an A, B, and C, and it has money going to the division, to the um, uh, to tax, and I think basically to the fund. If you look, I'm looking at your draft 4.2, just so you know what, what I've been using. So that's on page 61, which is 46 million and change to the division, six and a half million to tax and 58 million, which I think is sort of the setting up the six month reserve. So what we said was let's divide that by three and we'll appropriate 37 million. And we will uh, just do that to the, um, for the division of family and medical leave. And so, uh, so they can start to establish the program. So uh, using that model, the second instance of amendment deletes um, section 13B, the six and a half million to the tax department because we're not giving any money to the tax in fiscal year 24. And it deletes section C, the 58 and a half million. And instead we're going to give 37 million to the division of family and medical leave so they can establish the insurance program. So that's the first instance of amendment. And by the way, just remind you, you have your chart, but the tax department doesn't need funding until the following year. So we're giving money that's definitely needed the first year plus a little more. And we really, um, sort of towards what you thanked us for in setting it up, we really sort of tried to make sure the fiscal note that went to you is set up in those multiple years so that you would be able yes. to get out the money as you saw fit. Right. Yes. Which just made our lives so much easier. We didn't have to do as much math in public as we sometimes have. To. So that was that was really helpful. Plus, we, everybody could see it. So thank you very much for all of that. Um, so the second instance strikes out that to the Department of Tax, and then uh, which is Section 14. We just um, eliminate it, and then the third instance of amendment um, actually strikes out Section 15. It's almost like we did a strike all. We struck out Section 15 and replaced it with a new Section 15. And Section 15 has all of the positions over the three years to the division, the new division of family and medical leave. So you had all laid it out to, you know, what you need in FY 24, 25, and 26. And we just then basically kept or put in 15A, which is the six, six permanent classified and three permanent exempt positions that were required in FY24. And then everything that was not needed in 24, we took out. So, um, so that's what we did there. So those were the three big things that we did. Um, the other two amendments were back in section 12 and had to do with the private um, employer plans. And it's my understanding that some changes were made here and then then um, Ledge Council did kind of a search and paste and replace, and these two were missed. So that's really what that's about. Um, and that is uh, section 12, which is on page 60 of 66. And in 12A, we changed the words on the second line uh, that says chapter 26, beginning on January 1st to for calendar year 2026. So that was the change there. And then down in C2, uh, begin providing benefits 
it's actually July 1st of 2026 rather than January 1st of 2026. So those are the two technical amendments that hopefully make sense to you. <laughs> okay. Tax doesn't need any money until 24? Till 25. 25, but they do have to set up their IT. They don't need to do that until 2025. They have no money that they've requested in 2024. And frankly, I mean, we're giving 37 million to the division and, and it's to establish the program. Well, I guess if they wanted to change that and give anything to tax, they'd come back to us next year. And tax has to stand up a new tax. That's, I know. That's where they're costing. I know. And, and yet in the fiscal note, it's very clear when they need the money, which is not in fiscal year 2024. I, mean, I did ask that question. Again, I'm sure you asked the question too. Are you sure you don't need anything in FY24? And with all the zeros there, I... The answer appears to be yes. Did you have something? Yeah. Representative Shai, thank you. Um, just quick question. The 37 million is for the reserve and then the 3.8 million for the positions in, in or you're gonna- The 37 million in the way our uh, amendment is written. It, at all. it says for the establishment of the family and medical leave insurance program. Okay. So that would include what they need to do to start getting set up and those nine positions. $3.8 million worth of positions. Okay, thank you. So we didn't we didn't separate it all out. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Everybody kind of understand it all? This is good practice for me to talk about it. Yeah, no, public. I thought it was very clear. Okay. Uh, affirm what you said. Um, as long as the probes is convinced that the, the money or the next year is appropriate for what's needed in the work mm -hmm. done that I'm very happy. Yeah, with. we 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 kind of, you know, tried to grill people to make sure I, it's good. <laughs> it's important. These that days. We, we have to go by what people tell us and understood. Yep. No, and you were absolutely fully funding what the fiscal note said was required for next year. Right. And tensions around. Yeah. Years. Thank you. Yeah. Did your um, thumbs up mean anything, Representative Anthony? Okay. Good. Okay. Would anyone like to move the amendment? I would. <laughs> okay. Representative Anthony, move that we find the amendment from the Appropriations Committee on H66 favorable. And Representative Odie, seconded. Any further discussion? Thank you very much, Representative Shah. Thanks, Robert. Andrews, yes. Anthony? Yes. Back? Yes. Renegan? Yes. Demro? Yes. Maslin? Yep. Matos? Odie? Yes. Sims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Canfield? Yes. Kornheiser? Yes. 1101. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Good Good start to the day. <laughs> <laughs> This just came so close to showing the coffee. You did? Um, Sasha, all the tissue seems to have disappeared from our okay. table here. Yeah, I noticed it. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, yes. We're going to take a brief moment to find legislative counsel. Um, while we wait for legislative counsel, um, Jamie, this is a little off the cuff here. Do you want to join us for a minute? Sure. Okay. Good morning. I'm Jamie Fien, lobbyist with Premier Piper, Eggleston, and Kramer, here this morning on behalf of the American Property Casualty Insurance Association. That's a national trade association of, as you might expect, property casualty insurers, writing all lines of insurance, very creative in their naming, uh, all lines of insurance, uh, over a thousand members, including several hundred who write here in Vermont. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to speak very briefly to one particular fee um, that you have on your spreadsheet, which is 
uh, line 14, and it's called the certified copy three-year operating record. Um, in industry terms, sometimes it's called an MVR, or motor vehicle report. Um, and the proposal is to raise the fee from $14 per record to 17. Um, in case it's not familiar, you're not familiar with what this product is, auto insurers will access underwriting, you know, driving records to help uh, compile the underwriting uh, sort of framework in order to price a policy for uh, all of us for our auto policy. <laughs> insurers access these quite frequently. It could be at initiation of a, a relationship with a, an individual. It can be at renewal of auto policies, which are either annual or in some cases, six month policies. Um, and as you can see from your spreadsheet, there's considerable volume related to this particular product. Um, obviously, um, the industry, you know, would doesn't sort of favor a, a, a 20 percent increase, three dollar increase. But the primary reason I'm here to, this morning is to share that the fee you see on your spreadsheet is not the total fee paid by auto insurers. Auto insurers are required to go through an entity that administers transactions on behalf of DMV. Um, and that entity charges $4, an additional $4. Private entity. A, I believe it's a private entity. I, I'm not sure of the relationship that the government has with this entity, um, but they are required to uh, pay an annual subscription of $75 to be able to access uh, the fee. And then as I say, it's a $4 additional uh, fee per record. So the current um, fee that they're paying is $18, and this proposal would bring it, of course, to 21. And so I just, um, you know, it's it, obviously this is a, a, a product like any other product, and insurance companies as buyers, um, you know, may react to, you know, market changes, fee changes, et cetera. Um, I'm not saying that'll happen, but, you know, we prefer sort of modest increases given uh, the volume and that this is sort of a voluntary product. But also, I wanted you to be aware of this additional fee that uh, doesn't show up on your spreadsheet. And so this fee is not, so I've done a little research since a hallway conversation with Jamie yesterday um, when he approached me about this. Um, and so this is basically a contracted IT system from the Department of Motor Vehicles that privately administers an extra fee. And I don't know if people remember last year, there was sort of a privately administered court fee that we found out about that um, was causing some consternation in a sort of a similar way, because um, it wasn't a fee set by the legislature. Um, and we also know that the DMV is engaging in an IT modernization process that I think we talked about yesterday. Was that yesterday? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and that they haven't made a decision yet about whether or not they will fold in this system into that system. And I would recommend that they, given that they are modernizing all the IT, that they fold in this system. It sounds like it's a possibility to fold it in. Um, and that way you would actually be experiencing perhaps more ease of use as well as um, fees that you might have at least some ability to come testify about well, it, not control. Thank you for the additional information. I mean, I'm learning more and more because it's not easy to find out the information about this entity. I mean, if you go and search it, you get up a, a Vermont.gov website, for example. Um, and so, um, and the little that I've learned um, is that this additional add-on may be the only additional add-on that this entity charges users to access, you know? so. Um, when you say they may roll it in, I'm not sure, you know, what sort of pushback there may be if this fee is helping to subsidize the operations of this entity, for example. Well, I think perhaps we just wouldn't contract with that entity anymore. We would just. Yeah, I'm not sure what else they do for the state. Yeah. Uh, so two questions, Madam Chair. Um, how long has it been since this fee was changed? I believe 2016 okay. or 2018 in your. It's similar to the other fees. And. Yeah. Um, who pays it in the end? Is that a, a, the, in, the and specifically the increase, the four dollars? Is that something the insurance company puts back on their client, or is it the state of Vermont, or who pays that? It's it's paid by insurance companies, but ultimately all the costs that insurance companies pay are factored into what you know they're able to charge or are charging to policyholders. Their client, their people. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You and me as policyholders for companies. Any other questions for Jamie? And I'm sorry that we're contracting with a private entity that is um, 
you know, so untransparent to you as a person. Oh, I appreciate that. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a different scenario, right? I mean, here we are talking about a fee in front of you. You set the statutory fees. I don't even know how that fee is set and who has oversight over that additional fee. And while we don't have um, necessarily all that, you know, in this committee, we are not deeply engaged in the IT modernization process. I'm, you know, really happy to work with both transportation committees to ensure that this is included in the IT modernization process because it sounds like it's a possibility. Thanks for letting me bring this to this. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, Becky. Hi. Do you want to come take us through the language? Because I know where I am anymore. Are you the language of the DMV or the Secretary of State? Ah, we are on. H-479, transportation. Thank you. Okay. And what sort of... We're going to vote on it walk through. pretty much after the walkthrough. So um, good enough that we all feel like we understand. We've all had it. Um, so we've had the spreadsheet for a number of hours, for um, a number of days. And then um, I think we all had a chance to review the language last night. And so um, not excruciating detail, but we are voting on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, that's not, I don't know if that was clear enough for you, but I will speed you up or ask you to slow down as we sure. go away. Thank you. Okay, great. Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. So uh, this is draft 1.3 of the um, amendment to H-479, which um, adds all of the DMV fees and it also um, struck out the positions, just as a reminder for AOT, um, and added them to the end of this bill as well. Um, so the positions aren't lost, they're just being added to the amendment instead. Um, so I can just start off that this is, um, so the positions were in section 35 of the underlying bill. So this is um, striking everything that out and everything out after um, and adding a new section 35 um, for enhanced driver's license fees. Do you, do you want me to state the changes in the fees? I think that would be really, would anyone appreciate that from Becky? That seems <laughs> fairly laborious to me. Okay. I am, and I think sharing the screen might even be hard. Does everyone have it up themselves? Mm -hmm. Because if we're scrolling through, they're sort of, we'll get a little nauseous, I think. Three. Yes. Okay. Um, so I, there are section um, reader assistance headings to split up all of the fees. So um, after the enhanced driver's license fees are um, Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, I think, this up. Oops. For myself here. Um, all up one second <laughs> um, so section 114 um, has um, fees for miscellaneous transactions um, so certain registrations um, certified copies of applications uh, there are uh, sample plates, uh, periodic inspection stations, uh, fuel dealers, um, periodic inspection sticker records, um, certified copies of certain reports and notices, um, official photo ID cards, uh, listing of operators, <laughs> certain operators licenses. Um, do you I think that's sort of okay. Works. Yeah. Okay. Um, public records requests. Those are all sort of the types of miscellaneous um, transactions. Um, Section 37 is fees related to non driver ID cards. And so that fee change is. And you could just say Section 38. Is that? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, Section 38 is um, fees related to the general provisions for uh, registration. Um, so there are uh, vanity plates, uh, special organization plates, and uh, a one time fee for the uh, for yeah for different registration of um, issue number plates. <clears throat> Section 39 is conservation motor vehicle reg registration plate fees. Section 40, so I'm on page nine, um, is uh, building bright spaces for bright futures fund. Um, so these are uh, fees that for plates that uh, go into uh, this fund. Section 41, uh, registration certificate and replacement and corrected certificate fees. Section 42, so I'm on page 11, line 11, um, transfer fees. Really, really interesting stuff. <laughs> Can't make this better. <laughs> it's not, it's not your fault. <laughs> Section 43, um, uh, these are, okay, fees and exemptions for uh, type, certain types of vehicles, so pleasure cars. Um, section 44 is motorcycles. Um, section 45 is motor driven cycles. Actually, not even sure what that is, but <laughs> bow pads, okay. Great. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> you identify yourself for the record. For <laughs> no. <laughs> Section 46, um, so I'm starting on page 13 here, all surface vehicle registration fees. Section 47, uh, registration of um, trucks. So this in uh, includes tractors, truck tractors, or motor trucks. Um, and uh, these are, if you go to page 14, there are different uh, fees for, uh, for weights associated with those. Um, and then that goes all the way down to the end of page 15. Um, section 48 are trees fees associated for, with trailer and semi-trailer registrations. Then on page 16, section 49, line 17, there is an annual fee for registration of a motor bus. Page 17. <laughs> Sorry, I'm putting myself to sleep. Do okay. <laughs> you want to use different voices or something? I don't know. Section 50, uh, local transit, public transportation. Uh, Just for the record, I think many, like people really are following along. Okay. Because yeah. Denver was actually cross-referencing. Yeah. Right there with He's, you. He's cross-referencing cross this spreadsheet even. So I've we only are had attention. one cup of coffee this morning. Oh, I have only had one too. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> okay, section 51, um, exhibition vehicles, uh, fee registration. On page 18, there are uh, section 52 are fees for state municipal fire department and rescue organization vehicles. Um, page 19, section 53, uh, there are diesel powered pleasure car fees. Then we're heading into registration of dealers and transporters. So section 54 um, are registration fees and number plates for uh, dealers and transporters. And that goes um, down to page, the bottom of page um, 21. Section 55 is uh, temporary plates. Um, and page 22, section 56, um, uh, I think this is a out of state sale registration. 
B, section 57 on page 23, the motor vehicle warranty fee, um, and 58 is a fee for the transporter's registration certificate, number plate, or validation sticker. Um, the page 24, um, replacement of number plate fee. Uh, section 60 is a fee related to uh, sale of a vehicle out of state for anyone who is not a dealer. Uh, page 25 um, is a fee for an interest date in transit registration permit um, to move a vehicle uh, in, in Vermont out of state. I believe that you can correct me on that one. <laughs> um, page 26, um, so operator's licenses, um, section 62. Um, so this is fees for licensing an operator of a motor vehicle. Um, there are four year and two year fees um, and a fee for a motorcycle endorsement. Section 63 is a fee for replacement of a license. Page 27, section 64 is a learner's permit fee as well as a for a vehicle and a motor motorcycle learner's permit. Page 28, um, examination fees for a learner's permit, section 65. Page 29, section 66 um, is suspension and revocation fees related to a, a license. Section 67, so I'm starting at the top of page 30, uh, driver training school license fees. Uh, section 68 um, relates to possession of a license for a uh, driver's training school license. Um, section 69, page 31. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a fee for uh, each inspection certificate provided by DMV. Section 70, page 31, are fees related to, um, for vehicles that uh, have to register for certain weights on the highway. Uh, page... So those go down to page let's see, 35, section 71, um, fees for overweight, width, height, and length permits. And you can jump to page 38. Um, these are uh, fees related to titles of motor vehicles, section 72. And page 39, section 73, um, fees for certain um, vessels, snow snowmobiles and all-terrain vehicles, such as application for titles. Um, so title fees as well for those types of vehicles. Um, page 40, section 74 and line 11, uh, fees for commercial driver's license and learner's permit. Page 41, section 75, um, the uh, application for the commercial driver's license or learner's permit. And Page 42, section 76. So we're under motor vehicle purchase and use tax. Um, so uh, the, this sets the amount of the tax um, 
and I might have to phone a friend for this. So it's the amount of the tax or up to a certain for yes. each vehicle. Yeah, Madam Chair, this is a special provision that applies to large vehicles over 10,100 pounds. Um, so uh, yes. There's a provision in statute that they pay 6% of the taxable transaction price, but there's a maximum in statute, so this would increase that maximum. And I, you've told us about that a few times. Okay, great. I can't remember. What What is the... What kind of vehicle is a 10,000 pound vehicle? A truck. A tractor, yeah. Like a big truck, not like a person truck. Okay. <laughs> this is purchase and use. Correct. Right. Yeah. This cap does not apply to a passenger house. Mm -hmm. Does not apply to what? Passenger, passenger. Yeah, right. Big, big Back to you, Becky. Cars. Hey, uh, moving right along. Page, <laughs> page 43, sections. I'm sorry, one second, Becky. Oh, yeah, sure. Is that to help, help farms or, or to help commercial vehicles? Or ten wheelers. Yeah. Six wheelers, ten wheelers. Big, yeah. Big, yeah. yeah. Ten and four. So what would you think the policy consideration would be? Of what? Having a cap. Yeah. So that they are wear and tear on the road. Well, I'm wondering why they have a cap. I don't know. They're really expensive vehicles, I think. Yeah. Is this the, yeah. <laughs> and the weight has a cap, too. Yeah. Okay. Back to you. Okay. Um, so wrapping up page 43, um, section 77 are the positions that I refer to for AOT. So these were in the underlying bill and struck out and just put towards the end of this bill in case any changes um, need to be made in appropriations. Um, and then the effective dates. Um, so it, with respect to the fees, the fees will take effect on January 1st of next year. And that, everyone, is because of concerns about um, interfering with the IT modernization process. So rather than having it be effective July 1st, it's effective January 1st, 2024, because they're supposed to be launching this fall, the IT modernization, so that they'll have time. Okay. Um, so there are two sections in the underlying bill that take effect on passage, and then all other sections of the bill take effect on July 1st. I just have one question. I noticed in the trucks that the the fees are in cents also. All everywhere else they're kind of rounded. <clears throat> is there, is there a? I'm sure there's a good reason for it, but is there a? I remember Chris explaining the reason for that yesterday, but I don't remember what the answer was. I just remember it making sense. I, so I can answer that, Madam Chair. <laughs> in, in, so truck fees are really, really complicated, but um, the way the statute reads, um, they're not rounded off to the nearest whole dollar because what a what a truck operator or the registered owner would pay is based on the vehicle's weight. So um, the values that you see in the statute are then multiplied based on like you know. Which how many thousands of pounds that it that it is um, that where it falls within the chart, if you will, and um, then DMV takes that and produces a chart that's online that has like what you would pay total based on if your truck fits within a certain slot. So the, the values you see in statute are multiplied by other factors, which is why they're not rounded off in the statute. I'm just wondering whether that's whether that creates hassle somewhere where people are cursing and saying, you know, if they rounded these up, we would save a lot of time or money with these. Yeah, I think, I think the hassle, Madam Chair, would probably, with the, the folks who have to administer them at DMV, um, but they, they'll produce a chart that says in, in it's available online um, of what, if your vehicle weighs you know, between this many thousand pounds and this many thousand pounds, it's very straightforward what you're going to Yeah. OK. Thanks. I think this is for Chris. What's the difference between a uh, sample plate and a temporary plate? I would have to ask DMV. <laughs> that is not she a does not answer. She does not answer DMV questions. That is not a question I've had the opportunity to explore yet. Okay. Oh, I, I perhaps should not, but I have seen license plates that are for sort of like demonstration purposes that aren't really temporary. Okay. They're like, but they're not quite vanity plates, right? Okay. Tell us more. 
I just, like I have an image of like a license plate that has just like some random words. I'm not going to do anything on the whiteboard. I just like I can sort of visualize the difference and like then the temporary UCA access for their vehicles. Is that what you mean? No, I think that's a vanity. Plate. I'm okay. going to stop even trying. Yes. The infamous, I think, the the six three one license plate that the administration used for years. Oh yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm just dating myself here, but that was their big what. I think that's like a sample plate. It's, it's not actually used on a car. No, but yeah, it's, it's a real plate. plate. It's a real plate, whereas yeah. a temporary plate is not a real plate, but it's used it's on a, a car. Paper plate. Yes. Right, yeah. Okay. We also um... look how we solve our own problems. Okay, we're just <laughs> making stuff up, so I'm going to shut it down. Are you also hypothesis? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I actually okay, have something okay. for real. I know that you know in the case of um, missing heels, and this may be the answer to Representative Campbell's uh, question, may not be. But I know that, um, for instance, when a skier gets a tramway license, they're issued a plate that is made by the plate shop in St. Albans, and it looks like a license plate. Oh. So it may be, maybe oh. that. I don't know. I can can throw in Anthea and get back to you if you. No, we're good. No, no like, thank you so much, Mike. Really appreciate it. Okay, unless you, you didn't. Okay, no, great. A nice okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Ski Bico. Yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we vote out uh, H-479, uh, our strike all amendment favorably. Okay, second. Representative Demereau moved that we amend um, 479, and Representative Anthony seconded. Is there any discussion? Just in time. Yes, Representative Beck. I guess a question about, um, I guess we have three questions. So. The first one is, does does this language 100% um, accurately reflect what Chris presented in um, the other day? So it's, that's the same thing. The number, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and to answer Representative Beck's question, yeah, the, the language okay. that Legislative Council has before you, all of those changes should match exactly what was on my spreadsheet. Okay. I think the only, the only distinction in the conversation in the last two days is that the effective date um, is proposed to be January 1 to allow DMV some ability to continue um, rolling out the core modernization. So, you know, the first year of anticipated revenue would be, you know, less than the full year of revenue that was projected on my sheet. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't make the assumption that it would be exactly 50% less because uh, there is some seasonal variation in some of these transactions and some inherent timing delays, but I think it would be a little bit less than 50% of a full year's revenue to do okay. that. That's so you, you partially answered answer my second question. So we're not expecting in FY24 that this will generate 22.5 no, million. No, because of the something system. around half of that. Yeah, I would. I mean, I like to aim low and, and exceed yeah, sure. expectations, but I would, I would, if you were to put me in the hot seat right now and say, what do you think this will generate in FY24 without talking to the economist, I'm just spitballing here, I'd say you're in the ballpark of probably between eight and nine and a half million dollars. And then that 21 number represents more of sort of a steady state full year, uh, full fiscal year. So you'd be looking at slightly less than that. Okay. And then my last question is, is, is a process question. I just don't understand this. I. This this is this bill started in transportation. We have it now. I don't know if it stopped anywhere else. But I, I'm hearing from the people in transportation that they haven't looked at this bill. Is that true or so I think what so they voted out the big T bill, which yeah. is what we'll do a full vote on after we amend this, if we amend this. Um, okay. and then our amendment needs to go back to the transportation committee for them to hear it. Okay, so this hasn't stopped in transportation. The, the underlying bill has, but the yes. amendment absolutely not, hasn't. No, not until we vote on it, because that's okay. right. That's how amendments usually work, right? Okay, got it. And Carl did really fully follow along with the spreadsheet, and okay. um, I, I trust you. I mean, so, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I no, may no. have missed one or two, but yeah. I, I, okay. I was. Yeah. Those, are, those are my two questions. Best to do yes. that. Okay. Um, I'm fully supportive. You work through this; it all makes good sense. We got this memo today for. Um, Commissioner of Transportation, which seems to say, don't do this, um, it seems remarkably similar, similar in rhetoric to what we heard from Commissioner Gresham on other subjects. So, um, 
okay, I get their perspective. Maybe that's what they think they need to say. But um, I'm a little um, <laughs> miffed that we get that today. I'm just, this is just my comment for the committee. Well, I do think um, we are being responsive to much of the memo by um, moving the date to Understood. January 1st. Understood. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. The quick to please call the roll. Again, we are amending the T bill, which is 479. 479. Too many numbers floating around. Go ahead, sir. Ready? Okay, yep. so I'm sure. Andrews, yes. Anthony? No. Beck? No. Brannigan? No. Demro? Yes. Maslin? Yep. Mattos? No. Odie? Yes. Sims? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Canfield? No. Kornheiser? Yes. 840. And then the bill as amended, as folks might remember, and we have it up on our page, um, the underlying bill, it includes um, that mileage, um, the new mileage fee for electric vehicles. Um, and that's sort of the one area of jurisdiction that we particularly have on it, but the rest of it's just sort of the standard T-bill that we walked through with Anthea two days ago, anyone? Is that two days ago? I think so. Okay, great. Would anyone like to move the bill as amended? Representative Odie? Sure. Representative Odie moves that we find H-479 favorable as amended. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> Representative Anthony seconded. Any discussion of the bill as amended? Okay. The clerk, please call the roll. Andrews, yes. Anthony, yep. Beck, no. Brennigan, no. Demra, yes. Maslin, yep. Matos, no. Odie, yes. Sims, yes. Taylor, yes. Anfield? No. Hornheiser? Yes. 840. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now, Becky, if we could further torture you to take <laughs> us through the next, uh, the other amendment sure. um, in a conversation about H282. We have like 12 witnesses listed here. I don't think we need to hear from any of them unless someone wants to. So if you are in the wings on 282 and you want to speak to it, feel free to signal me about that in some way. Okay. Um, so this is draft 1.1 of H282. I just uh, realized that the version I had sent still had highlighting in it. So I just, it, it's the same, but I just sent um, Sorsha the version without highlighting. Thank you. Um, but I can go through it as is. Um, so this is an amendment to the act relating to the psychology interjurisdictional compact bill, and it is striking out the effective date and adding in the fees as a new um, uh, the fees after that um, that first section of the bill, and then the effective date is added in at the end. So this is um, the Secretary of State fees and it is split up um, versus the advisor professions, the board professions, and then the corporation fees. Section two of the bill is amending the uh, most of the advisor professions. And the way, I'm not sure if you heard this testimony yet, but the way the statute is kind of set up is that most of the advisor professions are in Title III, Section 125, and there's sort of a default like standard fee unless uh, there's an exception, and only the exceptions are listed in the statute. So when you're looking at the spreadsheet and looking at 3 VSA 125, you're not going to see all of the, uh, the advisor professions that are listed because they're only listed if there is an exception to the rule. Thank you. Um, that being said, I'm not sure the best way to go through it because 
it won't you you won't be able to um, just look at the spreadsheet as I'm reading it through like like it was for the DMV feed. I think we could just do the same um, basic construct of you sort of naming the headings as we skim along. With okay. That works so. So section two is amending 3 VSA 125. Um, you'll see on page two that the sort of standard application for registration is being changed from 75 to $100. Um, and again, that applies to all advisors unless there's an exception. And so um, the exceptions are listed below. Um, so those include things like certain kinds of uh, private investigators. Um, and then page two, line 11, subdivision two is the license or certification <laughs> application. So that standard is being changed across the board from 100 to 115, unless one of these exceptions of, um, apply. And so you have a list of exceptions here, um, and those include um, barbering or cosmetology schools and shops, um, funeral directors, uh, real estate appraisers, um, certain private investigator and um, security services, uh, individuals and agencies. Um, page three, you'll note um, lines 10 through 15 that there are is some new language. These aren't new professions. What is happening here is that these advisors are being taken, an exception is being applied to that um, standard fee for them. So that's why they have to now show up in statute, whereas before they, they were part of the default. Um, so those include certain kinds of barbers, cosmetologists, nail technicians, and estheticians, um, massage therapists, body workers, or touch professionals, opticians, physical therapists, and assistants, and then um, certain social workers. Subdivision four on line 18 includes, is where the uh, biennial renewal fees are. And so that standard fee is being changed from 240 to 275. And then what is listed below is the ex exceptions to that um, renewal fee. So uh, the exceptions- Sorry, one second. Yeah, sorry for the interruption. Um, are Reiki practitioners in here somewhere? Are they not in touch with, you know, I don't know sure um, what their cat is. I, um, I do not know. But, um, I've forgotten your title, Lauren. I'm so sorry. It's falling right on my head. Deputy. Lauren Hibbert, Deputy Secretary. Thank you. Um, Reiki, our um, professionals are included in massage. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. I've learned a great deal from this. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, page four. Um, uh, just is continuing to list those exceptions for the biennial renewals. Um, and then I'll just note on page five, you'll see some uh, added language here for barbering and cosmetology shop and the real estate appraiser trainee. Again, those aren't new fees, they're just being added as an exception to the list. Um, the uh, boxing fees are under our part of the advisor professions, but they uh, their fees are located in Title 26. So Section 3 is amending the fees related uh, to boxing. Um, and there, uh, so those are what's in Section 3. And then Section 4 is the mixed martial arts uh, related fees for the different types of licenses, um, both annual and biennial um, for promoters, contestants, uh, and different event licenses. Uh, and then the last fee in the advisor professions is um, the nursing home administrator. So on page seven, section five, and these are also fees that are 
outside of Title III and they're located in Title 18. And there's a fee for uh, the application and then the renewal. And then page seven, uh, section six, so I'm on line 13. This is uh, moving on to the board professions. Um, and these, so this will start following uh, the board, the separate board profession spreadsheet. Are people, is it people comfortable with Becky going a little faster? Okay, I can just, I can just name the, the profession. Cool. So section, section six is accounting. Um, page eight, section seven, allied mental health uh, profession related fees. Um, the, and those, sorry, those are section seven, eight, and nine. Page nine, section 10 is uh, architect fees. Section 11 is the chiropractor uh, fees. If you move on to page 10, line 14, section 12 is the dental fees um, for different dental professionals. Section 13 is engineer uh, related fees. Uh, moving to page 11, section 14, land surveyor fees. Section 15, nursing profession fees. Section 16, page 12, I'm on line 13, is uh, optometry fees. Section 7, osteo profession fees. Page 13 um, are various uh, pharmacy related fees in section 18. Um, and uh, there are some additions to this list, I believe, based on the changes to the definition um, for certain types of pharmacies and manufacturer, manufacturers. Uh, page 15, section 19, uh, psych psychology professional fees, and um, section 20, real estate uh, professionals, uh, broker salesperson license. Section 21, uh, veterinary fees. And then we get to the final part, which is the corporations division on uh, page 16. Uh, so the first uh, few sections here are related to uh, corporations. I'll just grab my list here. Um, uh, and those are, I don't know if you want me to list all the, the different types of fees, but they're um, you know, assume business name, um, reg registration, uh, filing or filings, um, copying fees, and those are all listed on, starting on the bottom of page 17, and those go all the way down to page 20. On page 20, section 25, you'll find the list of fees related to limited liability companies. And those are similar types of fees for things like articles of organization, um, amending your articles of uh, authority, reserve name fees, um, transfer of reserve name. Um, those um, go from page 20 down to page 22. I'll note on page 21, there are a few fees here that are new fees and those are um, because they never had a fee associated with them before. So that are, those are the articles of domestication, articles of termination, withdrawal of reserve name and statement of conversion. Um, page- Can I uh Page 19, mm -hmm. I don't know whether we talked about that. Um, line 12, that one doubles, was that? Line 12. Is that right, it goes from 25 to 50? 
application for amended certificate of authority. Um, I can just confirm on the spreadsheet. I don't, I don't know if Ted. Ted or Lauren, do you want to speak to that? So we're in the um, corporations under the, uh, was it? Line 12 was up a, just page, it was page 19, right? Uh, application for amended certificate of authority. I have that in this um, spreadsheet. It says it's for foreign registrations. Is that correct? It should be what? For amended certificate of authority? No, for um, article. It's the application for amended certificate of authority. Oh, they're, yeah, they're up to. 14, 14, yes, yes, 15 is correct. Sorry, Tim Barnett, Office. Um, it should be $50. Um, it hadn't been updated since like 293. Oh, that's one of the really early so late jump. Okay, yes, okay. <clears throat> Thanks for asking that. See, Becky, we're paying attention. Yes, <laughs> keep on going. <laughs> Feels good because I we spent a lot of time on these yes. numbers. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so I think I'm on page 22, limited liability partnership, um, section 26. So this is the uh, list of fees for limited liability partnerships. Um, similar types of fees for. Uh, you know, statement of authority, merger, um, amendments, uh, cancellation, reinstatement, and the change here on page 24, line 12, is a new line was added for amendment for foreign uh, limited liability. Uh, Partnerships, and that's because um, the foreign and domestic, I believe, had the same fee previously, and um, the foreign fee has changed from the domestic fee. So that's why a new line item had to be added. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, Becky, thank you. Line 16 on one of these pages, section 26, statement of denial. If you apply for something and the Secretary of State says no. Nope. Um, that was a great question. I, I don't know what a statement of today okay. was. It's not a biggie, but I'm just- I can look into it though if Lauren is not able to answer that. Maybe just in the hallway. Or yes. negative. Um, I'll have to look into that as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're on page 24. 24. Um, so this is uh, limited partnership section 27. Uh, the fees there for uh, the various fees related to um, limited partnerships and these go down to um, page 26. Um, it's like there's a, maybe a spacing issue there. I don't know if that's just because it's a PDF but I will Check the draft for that. Um, there are some new fees at the top of page um, 26, and I believe those are related to fees that are um, previously did not, those were previously a fee was not charged, so um, this fee is being added. And then the same issue for the um, foreign, free amendment of foreign limited partnerships. Um, this used to be the same fee as the domestic, and so it is being split out because it's uh, being charged a different fee. Um, then 
I'm realizing there's no reader assistance here, but I believe 11B is nonprofits. Um, so I can add that reader assistance if the committee would like me to do that. Um, so I don't. Sorry. If you're making other. Um, just sure, but if not, I don't think it's necessary. Okay, it turns out, okay, so there will be another change, so I can add that in. Okay. Um, a technical change? Um, so the change is actually in the effective date section, so the fees need to be effective on passage, but I think it sounds like the underlying bill needs to be effective on July 1st. Oh, so yeah. that Yes, if I could just speak to that. Okay. The underlying bill, um, I should have noticed this and my apologies for not. Um, the underlying bill, we would like it to be effective on January 1st, 2024, okay. because there's a six month on ramp once the bill passes to us for us to operationalize. Once the bill becomes effective, there's a six month ramp for us to operationalize the compact. And because of the volume of compacts and the amount of change, we'd like a year to be able to do that. Okay. So um, we're asking that the um, underlying SIPAC bill become effective um, January 1st with the goal to have those applications ready for psychologists July 1st of 2024, but the fees to be effective on passage. Okay. So I can add in the reader assistance setting becomes when I do that change. Um, section so section 28 are the fees related to nonprofit corporations and there um, is yes there is one new fee here on the top of page 29 um, as these uh, this was not a fee that was charged previously for restatement of articles of organization um there are some other fees related to um the secretary of state um mailing certified copies and sorry, this is for sorry for certified copies of section 29, is that right? Um, so a fees related to, to mailings of um, certified copies. And then section 30 and 31 relate to um, trademark and registration fees. Section 32, I think I need a reader assistance setting here too, so I'll add that in, is um, is related to UCC filings, um, and there was some language change there, um, just mostly related to trying to. Um, What's UCC? Universal Commercial Code. Uniform Commercial Code. Um, I do not want to say anything That's great. more on that. <laughs> <laughs> Wise lady. All I know is, is a business, if you uh, borrow with a Vermont lender, they will pass that fee on to you every now and again when it's due. That's all I know. I, I paid it a few times. I don't know why. Represent the map. Yeah, last page. Um, something we're crossing out, but I'm just curious. A fixture filing. So. That is being repealed in subsection D. It has to do with mortgage, um, recording of mortgages fees. Um, and I believe that it is, it's not, this section is dealing with mortgage fees in subsection A. So it's actually not repealing it. It's just adding um, fees for different types of filing and certain number of pages for those. Uh, I just never, I'm not familiar with the term fixture filing. So it's, I can get it. Um, um, we just need like another five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. I I can look into yeah, what that is. Just a curiosity. I just, um, uh, Representative Taylor, can you just wait a few more minutes? Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Do you, Lauren, yes. do you want to speak to fixture filings? What we're doing here is just, we're not removing the requirement of a fixture filing, which is a mortgage or the timber. Um, but what we're doing is repealing this section because it contradicts the above, which is this, that section says this section does not require a fee. And what we are doing is requiring a fee. So um, we need to repeal that section. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. The Representative Andrews, yeah. Um, my question is for um, Deputy Secretary Hammer. Um, going in the Wayback Machine, when we first talked about this issue, um, we discussed the fact that while raising fees for your office would um, improve your bottom line, it wouldn't make the department whole. And I just want to reconfirm with you that that's what we're doing here. That is still correct. And in fact, choosing the inflation model reduced the amount of revenue generated um, for our department for the Office of Professional Regulation um, that are proposed fees. We were sometimes going above inflation for our recommendation. Um, and these fees will help us um, considerably, but they will not get us completely out of the, our deficit. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I've lost track of where in the bill you are. Sorry, Beth. we're on the effective date. Oh, <laughs> yes. Great. Okay. Because I enjoy spending this time with you. <laughs> section 31. Um, so page 31, section 33. Um, the effective date right now is on passage. And part of the reason I think this has to be on passage for the fees is that there are some renewals that are um, coming up in June. So the fee changes, um, it would create complications if this fees um, were not effective until July 1st, because then there could perhaps be folks who renewed in June paying a different fee than those in July. So effective on passage is um, administratively um, easier <laughs> okay. uh, for the fees, but it sounds like there's a proposal for the section one of the bill, the underlying bill to have that January 1st, 24. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like you need to make a few quick changes um, and then come back to us with it. Yes, I can um, probably just do those. Oh, great. Thank you. Because I don't, Jen signs off on the, the part. Okay, then we're just gonna take a five minute